Good morning, everybody. Here again is another colloquium from the Instituto of Astrophysica de Andalusia. And today we will have the talk from uh, Dr. Professor Luis Jara from PMOD in Davos, Switzerland. And uh, she will talk about flaring on the sun at all scales. And Dr. Luis Jarra will be proper, properly introduced by uh, Isabel Marquez, our uh, scientific director. Isabel, please. So hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank for, thanks for coming to our, um, to our um, colloquium, our Severo Ochoa colloquium today. Uh, for us, it's a pleasure to have uh, with us today, Professor Luis Jarra. She's director of the uh, physically, I, I'm going to say it wrong, I'm, um, I, I, I know that. So, apology, <laughs> sorry. Physikalist Meteorologist Observatorium Davos the, from the World Radiation Center in, in Switzerland. Uh, she's also an affiliated professor at uh, ETH in Zurich Institute of Particle Physics and Astrophysics. Previously, she was a professor of solar physics at the University College in London Muller Space Science Laboratory. She has taught a number of courses at undergraduate uh, and postgraduate level and supervised more than a dozen PhD thesis. Uh, she also enjoys public outreach, and in, in fact, she re regularly gives talks and, and media interviews. Her research career has been mainly focused on the understanding of the mechanisms that trigger solar flares and coronal mass ejections, and on solar wind formation and propagation. She's also, in fact, of more than 290 papers in this subject. During her career, she has been closely engaged on the design, build, operation, and data analysis of spacecrafts at the highest levels. For instance, she was project scientist and, and PI of the Hinode EUV imaging spectrometer until last year. And she's also co-PI of the EUV imager on the ESA Solar Orbiter mission launched in 2020 that we have the pleasure to know quite well in this, in this institute. Her research work has received a number of awards, like the Arthur Clarke Award for Research, the RIS, uh, RIS uh, Chapman Medal, the RIS uh, Group Achievement Award for the Inada ES Instrument, and an honorary professorship in China. She is um, a member of prestigious committees, both at national and international uh, levels. And today she will talk about flaring on the sun at all scales. Uh, we, we are very grateful, uh, Louis Hara, Professor Louis Hara, for for accepting our invitation to provide us uh, with, the, with this seminar. And uh, we extend the invitation to, uh, uh, when the time will allow to, to come here in person in, in Granada uh, to, uh, to take profit of our good weather, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, so welcome here. And um, the, the uh, discussion will be led at the end of your seminar by, by Professor Jose Carlos del Toro. And um, so, and I, I apologize, I will have to leave before the end of the meeting because I have another one, but, but I insist on extending the invitation to come here. Thank, thank you, you as well. And thank you for the introduction and the invite. And I certainly look forward to visiting um, when we can. And I'll be trying to show in my presentation at different aspects of what can be observed with Sol Orbiter. And hopefully it will be obvious how closely we can connect um, our sciences of the different in our, our institutes. So I'll be concentrating on flaring on the sun and flaring at all scales. So from the very small scales to the large um, events that can have an impact on us. So in this movie that hopefully you can see, I think Jose Carlos said it was a bit um, slow, but hopefully you can see that this is uh, a movie in extreme ultraviolet of the sun and that um, it's very dynamic when you look in extreme ultraviolet. You can see a lot of activity occurring and this is the kind of thing that we're interested in understanding. So you can see uh, there's a filament eruption here. You can see this active region that's um, very dynamic and this is a, our sun is a simple middle-aged star um, but you can see how active it is and it's important for us to understand that activity because uh, it applies to other stars and other um, exoplanetary systems. And just to put the size scales in context, there's an image to scale of the Earth. Um, so again, to remember the size scales when we're talking towards the end of the talk 
of the impact that the sun can have on us. So the outline of the talk is I will describe solar water, which I know you're very familiar with, but I'll talk a little more um, maybe about the instruments that we're involved in to give you a different slant. And then I'll be talking about flaring at all scales. So from the small scales that can contribute to the solar wind, that happens all the time. So as we're sitting here, the solar wind is flowing past us. Um, and to the large scales that are related to the significant space weather events. So an important thing to keep in mind, which um, I'm sure you all know, is that the sun is a magnetic star. And that's an important factor in us understanding um, where the solar wind comes from. So you can see in this image where the magnetic fields are shown by these white lines. And um, this is produced uh, using magnetic field data um, from the photosphere. And you can see here that there are closed field lines. You can see especially around this bright region. And that's where the plasma is trapped within the field lines. And then you can see regions that are dark where you've got open field lines. So in these regions here, um, the plasma is free to escape. And particularly in the polar regions here, that's where you'll see the fast solar wind. So solar orbiter, hopefully you're, you're all familiar with it um, and the excitement that's been happening this year. The science goals of it are what drives the solar wind and where does the coronal magnetic field originate from? How do solar transients drive heliospheric variability? How do solar eruptions produce energetic particle radiation that fills the heliosphere? And how does a solar dynamo work? Um, so these are the, the fundamental questions. And the overarching question is, how does the sun drive activity in the heliosphere? So all of these activities that are mentioned, the solar winds, solar transients, solar energetic particle events, those are all things that we care about because they impact us here on Earth. And of course, the launch was in February 2020, which was the last physical meeting I think I was at, <laughs> where I did see um, some of the people at your institute, which was very, very nice. So this is a, a schematic of the, the spacecraft and our institute here was involved in two instruments, the EUV imagers and the SPICE instrument, which is a spectrometer. And I'll be talking quite a bit about um, spectroscopic data of the corona as opposed to spectroscopic data in the photosphere that you're, you're maybe more familiar with. Um, so I'll concentrate on this aspect. So the spacecraft, um, again, as you're aware, its closest encounter will be 0.28 AU, um, which is the closest any telescope has been to point at the sun. And it has a heat shield to protect it because of this. And that heat shield um, will reach 500 degrees at the front at its closest point. And one of the very interesting aspects of this orbit is the orbit of Texas right out of the ecliptic to peer right down at the poles. And we have never observed images of the poles before. So this, this stage of the mission is, will be a very exciting one. And that happens towards the end of the mission lifetime. So if there's any, students there who are just starting their undergraduate, that time scale for you to do PhD is just about perfect to have the first view of the polls. It will definitely be an exciting time for us. So to summarize the remote sensing instrumentation that we have. So this is one of our instruments here, the EUV imagers, and it consists of three telescopes. Um, it's the full sun imager, has two filters in it, and then it has a two high resolution imagers, one in the EUV in the corona, and one in Lyman alpha, which is roughly chromospheric. And then another instrument from Switzerland is STIX, which is measuring high energy. So it's measuring the high energy output of, of flares, looking at both the thermal and non-thermal emission. And in the past few days, Styx was switched back on again, and there is an active region that has produced quite a number of flares, which is, is quite exciting to get that. SPICE is a spectrometer, and uh, it will produce um, spectra at each pixel in an image. 
and we do have one of the active region that is on the disk currently and that was taken a couple of days ago so we haven't started to look at that data yet then there's a chronograph um, here which blocks out the disk of the sun so you can see the coronal emission uh, move away we have the heliospheric imager which is looking away from the, the, the sun line so that you can see things moving through the heliosphere and then um, these data sets are from your instrument in Granada, the fee instrument, and you can see the different range of measurements that can, can be made, both high resolution and full disk. So it's a huge array of information. So we've got images and spectra right from the visible range to the X-ray range, right from the surface of the sun, way into the heliosphere, and we're measuring all these plasma parameters. So the velocity, the density, the temperature, magnetic field, and the chemical composition. And these are all very key parameters to measure in order to link into what is in the solar winds. So what is flowing past the spacecraft? What is flowing past the Earth? We need to understand these to make that link. So for the full sun imagers, this is um, an indication of what we will see. So we'll have a, an imager when we're at um, 0.28 AU, which will have this field of view. So you'll see these large scale coronal structures. And then we'll have the high resolution imager which zooms in. And we don't know what we'll see yet because we've never seen those resolutions yet. And then when we get out of the ecliptic and look down at the poles, this is a simulation of what we'll see here. So we'll have a fantastic view of the polar region where you have um, open field lines and coronal holes where the fast solar wind is, is coming out. And we have no idea what's there. So the current data that we have, this was the first image that we took on the 12th of May this year. This was when we were close to the Earth. So this is not our highest resolution, but it was the first image we got when we opened the door. So it's a very special one to the team. Um, and this is a movie of the high resolution imager here so you can see um, details of the quiet sun and if you zoom in a feature such as this so this has been labeled campfires in the press release so they're small energetic events that are not seen in current instrumentation so this is something that we're currently working on to understand the calibration and will be presented at a conference next month so if you're, you're going to the AGU, you'll get to hear more about these and Coast Bar as well. So if we go on to the science questions, one of the first ones is what drives the solar wind? And we'll start with um, one type of the solar wind, which is a slow solar wind. Um, and the slow solar wind is, is more complex than the fast one I've referred to, which comes from the coronal holes. The slow solar wind has multiple sources um, we're not really sure exactly what creates it. It's very complex. Um, active regions are one source. And you can see in this movie here, one of the results from the Hanode um, mission that Isabel mentioned is that we can see at the edges of active regions. So this is an active region in um, observed in X-rays. And at the edge, you can see these spurting, jetting uh, material at the edge of the active region. And this is one potential source of the slow solar wind. And this is what this uh, solar wind data looks like in situ. So you can see how much it varies because this is Krona Hall data here. And this is a slow solar wind here with these unusual bumps and changes. And we're measuring on the disk and then we have to wait until the wind travels one astronomical unit before it's measured. So it's always been extremely difficult to connect up what the solar wind is, is doing because of that distance. And if we look at the fast solar wind, if we look at our, the polar data that we can currently see, this is also X-ray from Hanode, um, work by Jonathan Certain. And the poles here, um, the polar coronal hole is not empty. It has these small features in it that jet, and they jet regularly. So if you pick any region here and stare at it, you'll see jets in it eventually. What we do know is that um, if you look at the solar wind, so this is a, the speed of the solar wind, 
and this was measured at 2.4 astronomical units by the Ulysses missions, it's very flat, really. It, it looks like the sun is having a little snooze. If you look at one astronomical unit, which is where most of our measurements are taken, um, it fluctuates more. Um, and then this measurement was taken in the 1980s by the Helios mission, which, which reached, reached point 0.3 AU, but was blind. It couldn't see where the sources were. And you can see how much it fluctuates by. So by the time you get in close to the sun, it's much more dynamic. So are these dynamic events here measured in the speed and the solar wind, are they related to these jet type features that are so small? These are, are tiny in the sun. So this is something we want to explore. And then this is the solar wind as it's moving from the sun is over here on the right hand side. And you can see um, all the material that's moving through the heliosphere here. Here's Venus and here's the Earth. So on every day we have this flow of solar wind going past us. You can see these density fluctuations in it. You can see um, variations in it that um, have an impact on us and, and very high our magnetic field on the Earth reacts to it. So it is important to understand it. So this is the sun on a quiet day, solar wind on a quiet day. So you can see there's this constant streaming material leaving the sun. And then on a, a dynamic day, this is the very famous Halloween storms back in 2003. Um, so you can see how dynamic it is, and you can also see the snow effect on it during particular storms. And th those are energetic particles that are reaching the detectors very, very quickly. Um, and this is one of the goals of the Solar Orbiter mission is to understand what creates those and um, how they are transported um, through the solar system, how they're accelerated. So how can we understand when the sun is so far away? We've got one astronomical unit between us and um, the sun. So what has happened over the past decades is two missions have been worked on to try and get close to the sun. One is the Parker Solar Probe mission, a NASA mission, and that gets very close to the sun and it concentrates on the in situ measurements. So um, magnetic fields, radio data, um, and so on. It can't see what it's looking at or can't see what the sources are. And then we have Solar Orbiter, which combines both the telescopes and the in situ measurements that sits a bit further away. So to understand that these two missions have been developed, and these are some first results from the Parker Solar Probe mission. And uh, during the first encounter it had, it was launched in 2018, and during its first encounter, it was noticed that you got these, um, what are called switchbacks. So you can see in this movie that the magnetic field just doesn't go outwards in a more or less straight line. It's dynamical. There's these switchbacks where the magnetic field turns back on itself and goes forward. And you can see this in the data, the, um, the magnetic field data. Here, you can see how it varies like this. And you've got, uh, compressions as well going along with that, um, which is consistent with these switchbacks. So um, this is one thing that, that people are looking at to try and understand. This is happening close into the sun and may help us understand the source of what's ending up on the solar wind. So this is work um, led by Stuart Bale and Justin Casper, both published in Nature last year. Really interesting work. Um, and we've been working with um, the Hanodi mission and Parker Solar Probe on Parker's first two encounters. So the first encounter was in November 2018. And this is this one. And during this time, the sun was quiet, as in dead quiet. There was a coronal hole, no active regions, nothing on it. The next encounter, there were two active regions during this in April 2019. So this data is showing you um, evidence of type three bursts or showing you measurements of type three bursts. So in encounter one, you can see that there are little peaks here. So even when the sun is, is dead, 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 
there were still type three bursts coming from it, which is very interesting. In encounter two, you can see even more type three bursts. So the type three bursts are indicating um, electrons, SEP, solar energetic particles flowing out from the sun. So it's something that we really want to understand. Now these measurements that are made here, by 1AU we wouldn't see these. We don't know that those are happening from us sitting here at Earth. We had to get in close to see these. So this is an array of data. You don't need to try and understand it all, but there are some key measurements that um, we looked at during counter two. So this is when we had two active regions, um, the first of which was during this period that we looked at. And you can see this is the X-ray light curve and there are no fluctuations, there are no flares at all. So flaring is not the source of those type three um, bursts. The UV emission here measured from um, SDO in the corona slowly, gradually increases during this time when you see all these type three bursts. And then you can use the frequency of these type three bursts to measure the um, source height. So during this time, the source height gradually increased, which is consistent with um, a source that is increasing in altitude or decreasing in density. So this is the period that we started to look at. And we looked at it with the Hinode ice data to try and see if we could find a source in the active region that could be creating this. The other, the second active region was flaring and it, it behaved in a different way. But this first active region had no flares, but had all of this related to it potentially. So this is the active region um, and it just emerges and you can see it start to develop um, and you can see it increase in size. You can see the loops become brighter as you could see in the, the light curve of the extreme ultraviolet intensity just gradually increased. Um, so this is a, it's, there's nothing special about this active region. It's a very simple one magnetically. Um, but something in this active region created those um, type three bursts, the energetic particles. So we looked at it in different ways um, and we had spectroscopic data. So um, this region shows you where our field of view was. And this is where we see um, blue shifted upflowing plasma here. Um, and we looked at the, the minimum of the velocity in, in ice in this region. And we can see that that fluctuates. This is a high cadence study. Um, and then we compare it to the type three emission and you can see how frequent this is. This is just one hour's worth of data and this is fluctuating and this is fluctuating. So we can see that um, we have something dynamic going on here, even though this active region is not flaring, it's not doing very much at all. In the region where you've got blue shifted um, emission, there are fluctuations occurring. So we concluded then that the most likely source is at the edge of the active region where in the movie earlier, you could see the, the flowing material coming. So the magnetic field of the sun is extremely complex and we can look at sources on the disk, but then we have to understand if they can actually escape into the solar wind or not. And that, that is much more complex because if you have overlying magnetic field closed magnetic field, it could trap something that's trying to, to leave the sun. So not all upflowing regions will leave the sun. So we have to understand the sun as a whole in order to understand what makes it into the solar wind. And to do that, we need to understand the magnetic field extremely well. So the other mysterious thing in the fast solar wind is a phenomenon called stealth jets. So in the movie that um, I showed you of the, the um, poles, you could see these very bright jets that are repeatedly uh, going off. In addition to those, you can also see uh, features in spectroscopic data only that are only seen in the Doppler velocity or in the non-thermal velocity. But the non-thermal velocity is a measure of the line width um, of an optically thin line. 
and that's the excess width above the thermal width. So you can see an example here. If you look in intensity, there's hardly anything. If you look in non-thermal velocity, you can see something very strong here, although the intensity is weak. So this is um, work that um, Peter Young did a paper on and called them stealth jets. Um, and my student Conrad Svanich is currently doing a study of, of these features to try and see um, what is actually creating them. But they also could be a factor in what's creating uh, solar wind. And just to remind you again of the EUI um, first press release. So all these small features here, examples like this, and you can see flowing plasma coming upwards. And in our first data sets that we started to look at when we explored it, it's like five minutes of a high cadence data set. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these in a small field of view. So these could be contributing again to the solar wind in a way that we still don't understand. We still don't understand these little features yet, but you can see them wherever. I'm trying to move my <laughs> cursor to point to them, but they are quite fast and there's many of them. Um, so this is something that we're definitely exploring, which is interesting. So one of the big things about solar orbiter is its ability to get out of the ecliptic to look down at the poles. And one of the big things that we don't understand is, is the sunspot cycle. So the sun has a cycle which is roughly 11 years, where you have a period where you have a lot of sunspots um, called a solar maximum, and then they reduce and then you get a solar minimum period, which we've just come out of and we're just starting to get active regions of the ne next cycle come in. We don't know why that period is particularly 11 years. Um, we can't predict what the next cycle will do um, very accurately. Um, so the magnitude of the cycle is important to know whether we will be in a period where it's um, extreme activity or the reverse that it, it's a period where it's very low activity. And both those extremes can affect the impact on the earth both on the irradiance into the, um, that affects the climate and also on the uh, technical, um, technical issues that we're all reliant on like spacecraft or electricity, the way our electricity functions and so on. So we really want to understand the solar cycle and to be able to predict it in the long term. And the big weakness in the models that we have currently is understanding this pole these poles, so we don't see them. We don't know what's there in detail, um, but we know that the, the polar regions, the magnetic polarity flips um, during the cycle and it flips in a very slow way, very intriguing way. Um, but we won't, until we get to see those poles, um, we won't understand the details. And this is a, a visualization that NASA put together over um, a solar cycle or so, so you can see um, how, how dynamic it is, um, how complex it is, and maybe you'll understand why we don't understand it yet, because we're missing the key bits at the polar regions. Um, so it is something quite magical about it. But this is going over um, a solar cycle, so we went past minimum period, started just past minimum, and you can see how it changes. Um, with time over um, around a 10 year period. So then we'll move on to solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Um, so a solar flare is basically emission right across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and that happens over tens of minutes. So it's a short, fast energy release burst across the electromagnetic spectrum. Coronal mass ejections, on the other hand, um, are releases of plasma and magnetic field into the heliosphere. So this is a coronal mass ejection, and this brightening is a flare. With flares, you don't always get a coronal mass ejection, but often with big flares you do, but not always. So again, there's a lot to be understood about this. Some flares have a lot of solar energetic particles and some don't have as many 
um, their solar energetic particles accelerated through shocks in the CMEs as well. So these are very interrelated phenomena, but they don't always go hand in hand. So a flare, what creates a flare? So you've got solar differential rotation. So that's the rotation, special rotation that a ball of plasma has where it rotates faster um, at the equator than at the poles. On top of that, you've got convection, which is um, occurring everywhere in the sun. So you see that on small scales on the sun. So you've got two ways of moving stuff around, differential rotation and convection. If you move plasma around, you're going to get magnetic field created, and this will store coronal magnetic energy. So the magnetic energy is built up um, and it will be stored and then it will be released at some point. And it will be released through radiant energy, so the flare itself, so covering the electromagnetic spectrum, mass motion, coronal mass ejection, and accelerating fast particles, electrons, ions. So you've got movement, you've got storage, and then you've got release. So we know quite a lot about flares, but what we don't know exactly is how the energy is stored. And we definitely don't know at what point that energy will be released. And we also don't know what the ratios between these are. So we can get a flare where all the energy just goes into the electromagnetic spectrum. Or we, we can get a flare where not much flare, we can get a small flare, so not much radiant energy, but you get a big coronal mass ejection with it. So we don't understand the differences between these different um, energy releases and how that works. So spectroscopy, EUV and ultraviolet spectroscopy measures from the chromosphere to the corona. And that can provide an insight on the stored coronal energy, any non-thermal behavior, dynamics in the flare itself, and also in the, the eruption itself, if there is one. So we use the spectroscopy um, for many, many different aspects. Now, this is a very simple model of a flare. And if you remember back to my first movie, you can understand that most flares don't look like this at all, <laughs> but this is a model that provides us um, good input into understanding roughly what happens. So we know that reconnection occurs high in the corona. So this is where you've got these magnetic field lines, they pinch together and they release energy. Particles are accelerated in both directions here. Um, so particle acceleration takes place here that heats up a coronal X-ray source here. The accelerated particles flow down the legs of the loops, <clears throat> and then they reach the, the denser uh, atmosphere here um, and cause that plasma to evaporate up. So we see evidence of nearly all of these things in the observations, nearly. We don't see the acceleration, but we see evidence of coronal x-ray sources, we see coronal x-ray foot points, we see evidence of evaporation, and we see evidence of these precipitating particles. So there's a lot that is consistent in this model, but a lot that is still not understood. The sort of the complexity of it, flux emergence is really key to understanding flares. And this is simulations that um, and modeling that Mark Cheng led um, to show you the complexity of the magnetic field so you can see that previous cartoon where you've got two, two foot points sitting there is, is not exactly real what happens in the real world. Although this is a simulation, that complex magnetic field with the mixed polarity, the black and white is showing you the magnetic polarity, is actually observed. It's observed in magnetograph data. Um, and you can see that complex field, it's known as um, serpentine field as flux emerges. And you can see the complexity of the loops here that are, are seen above that. So it is a complex thing. Flux emergence is important. So if you do get flux emergence, the chances are you will, you will get a flare. If you get flux emergence into a pre-existing sunspot group, 
you're likely to get a flare as well. So this is an example of data, coronal data. Um, this is from Hanode X-ray telescope data. And it's a series of images of an active region um, measured in X-rays. And the first image I'll show you, um, the bright loops here are lying in a potential state as in they have no shear here. So this is a polarity inversion line. So it's sitting nicely under these loops. So it's, it's a very relaxed magnetic field here. There's no additional energy in it. And that's on the 10th of December. If you track the way through um, to over a day later, this is where the polarity inversion line was lying. It's right along that loop. So the loop is twisted such that it is uh, distorted along the polarity inversion line. So you can imagine how much energy is stored um, at that point. And you can see how it's slowly shearing. So it goes from this nice potential state and starting, starting to move here. Um, this is happening during a flux emergence event. And you can see it ends up highly sheared and then there's a huge flare occurred. So you can track the energy that's in um, a flare by looking at twisting, looking at shearing and looking at turbulence. So it's some measurement that we can do to try and work out when a flare occurs. So here you've got an X-ray light -like curve um, here. So this is the big flare we're concerned about here. Um, and you can see how many small flares occur beforehand. So when you've got a new active region, and you've got new, new flux emergence, there's a lot happens. It isn't just one flare and you can tell when that's going to happen. It'll be a lot of small flares and then there would be something that builds up to allow that big flare to erupt. Um, so in here we see the measurement of helicity, which is measured from the magnetic field. And in this, uh, as is often seen in, in active regions um, before flares, the helicity is a measure of the, the twist in the magnetic field. And that slowly rises um, before the big flare occurs. In the corona, so this is photosphere, in the corona, what we do see is a measurement of the turbulence, which is the non-thermal component of the emission line. And that rapidly goes up hours before that big flare occurs. So there's a big buildup in turbulence, there's a buildup in helicity um, before the flare occurs. And there, there's nothing significant here before these other smaller flares, um, although the time cadence isn't isn't perfect for this. So solar flares, again, this is the standard model. So you've got reconnection here, you've got plasmoid misdirection. You've got um, a source here created from the accelerated particles here. You've got the foot points here and so on. And then you've got this flux rope here. That's something that's extremely hard to observe. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is a rare example of um, a flare that fits nearly exactly what that model looks like if you turned it on its side. So you've got this region here, um, which is dark, which is where that plasmoid is. So the reason why we, we find it hard to observe is it, it is dark. <laughs> so you're looking in the, uh, a dark region here. But you can see the flaring loop underneath, the bright loops underneath here. And this was one where we managed to get spect spectroscopic data throughout this um, flaring loop here, which took us quite a few years to get the active region and the flare happening at the limb at the right time for us. So there's a wealth of data in that. But to go back to the, flare, or the early stages of the flare, this is an example where we looked at a number of active regions before they flared and um, we measured the, the turbulence in them again. And what we saw was that in flares that were eruptive, i.e. associated with a coronal mass ejection, that you have um, these red regions are showing where you've got enhanced uh, non-thermal velocity before the flare. The dark regions here are showing you um, after the flare when the coronal mass ejection erupted and plasma was pushed away. So this is evidence from after the flare, but before the flare, 
these red regions were what part of the region was activated. It wasn't in the actual flare site itself, slightly off from that, but that's the flux rope being activated before it lifted off. So that's this part here is where we could actually see evidence of um, in the spectroscopic data before it went. And then this data here is showing you, whoops, I do apologize. Um, this is a spectroscopic data of that flare again. Um, and we zoomed in on the dark region. So that, that bit in the flux rope, that's a mysterious, mysterious region. Um, and this was at a hot, hot temperature line that it was observed in. And this is the RN15 spectrum here. And this really excited us because the spectrum was so blue shifted that it was blue shifted out of the spectral window. The speeds in this part um, of the, the flare itself are more than 300 kilometers per second coming towards us. So this is something we hadn't seen a spectrum quite as, as complex before. And it's something that needs to feed into the models to understand the flux rope. Uh, we also see this filamentary material, which is cool material often associated with flares. And we also saw uh, fast blue shifted uh, material as well, which is expected and see, has been seen before. So then we have um, eruptions that take place basically across the whole solar disk. Right, so this is a flare that occurred um, on the limb. And this is showing you um, basically the different temperatures. So the, the different colors are showing you different filters in AIA, and it's, it's giving you an indication of the temperature. But the main thing to pay attention to is the fact that this is a global phenomena, pretty much. It starts on this limb and then it transfers itself more or less. You can see evidence of it right over here. So it's going right the way around the disk. What's going to be really interesting is when we with Solobiter, when we have a different view from the Earth observing spacecraft, that we'll be able to see this track um, the whole way around the disk, which will be amazing. Um, and we have observations of these, they're called coronal waves. We have observations of these also spectroscopically. Um, and this has been a real source of uh, information to help us understand what's going on. So that's the, the end of the slides. And I just want to finish by wishing Solar Orbiter good luck and uh, talking a little bit about what we're doing next on Solar Orbiter. So we have taken data the past uh, few days. So we're having checkout windows where we're taking data and we're, we're getting some nice data, even though it's supposed to be mostly calibration data. Um, and we'll be in our science proper science mode at the end of next year. And that's when we'll be able to properly combine the instruments together to address the issues that we have, have mentioned. So, so things like those small phenomena we've seen already with uh, EUI. So those measurements were taken at a roughly 0.6 AU. So when we get to 0.3 AU, we'll have roughly double the spatial resolution. So we'll be able to see so much more when we're in our final orbit. And what we really need to do to understand those is to see the magnetic fragments underneath them. So are we getting small scale flux emergence? Are we getting cancellation? What's happening under those, underneath those events? So we need to understand those, um, how frequently they occur, where they occur, are they in different regions of the sun and so on, and how those could possibly link to the extremely dynamic solar wind that we we see in Parker Solar Probe. Um, so that's one of the questions for the quieter, um, quieter sun. And then we've got the coronal hole action as well, where we've got the fast, the fast solar wind and we've got jets in there, we've got stealth jets in there, we've got tiny filaments in there. Uh, but what is it that actually creates those switchbacks, for example, um, that we see in the, the solar wind data? And then we have the flaring aspects as well. So we know that active regions without flares can have an impact on the solar wind. And the active regions with flares have a more significant 
effect. So understanding when a flare triggers, why it starts, why it's sometimes with coronal mass ejections and why it's sometimes with solar energetic particles is something that we want to understand with this mission. And there's a lot of science to do with this mission. Um, so hopefully if any of you are students, you'll be able to join us on the team. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you. For this very nice talk. And now the talk is open for questions and uh, Jose Carlos will uh, manage the administration of the questions. So Jose Carlos. Jose Carlos, do you want me to stop sharing so you can see people? Okay, as you want. Uh, yes, yes, probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that, much better. Yeah. <laughs> For all participants, if you, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand or uh, write the question in the chat box. Yeah. So uh, let me just first thank you very much for a, for a wonderful talk. I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, I've learned a lot and I have myself uh, a couple of questions that uh, I will let uh, do to the end because uh, you, you've, been, you've been showing, you've been showing uh, uh, really cool material. It, 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 it was uh, very exciting. So is there any, anyone interested in Breaking the ice. Everybody wants a lunch. <laughs> still er, uh, uh, too, too early. Too early, is it? <laughs> too early. Too, uh, still too early. So, so may, 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 maybe I, I, I can start because uh, it, 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 the, 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 first, the first thing I, 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 I stroke to me it was your first slide. And it's been also repeated in, in the David Long uh, 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 display mm -hmm. of how global, how global uh, uh, solar phenomena can mm -hmm. be. To me, as a, as a photospheric solar physicist, a, a always obsessed with highest, yeah. uh, higher and higher resolution, looking at those global effects uh, uh, covering the whole star are simply amazing amazing and uh, eh, 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 can you can you tell us illustrate us uh, a little bit on, on, on the degree of knowledge we have in that regard how 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 close are we to understand this huge event i think i mean there is some level of knowledge on how they propagate and they will propagate you know, they'll do things like they'll avoid coronal holes and their propagation and so on. So there is um, some knowledge of how they propagate. Predicting, I mean, we, we have tried, as you know, Hanode ICE is a small field of view instrument and we have tried to observe a coronal wave as it propagates away, but you have to be in the right direction. <laughs> you have to know which direction it's going in to catch it. Um, and we have failed quite a number of times. So if you're looking at an active region to know which way it's going to propagate and which magnetic field is going to interact with i think that isn't sometimes it can be a bit obvious but sometimes it's just not clear um so i don't think we know that yet to know the direction um and that has been challenging with small field of view instruments and it will be it will be possibly worse than solopita <laughs> um, um but having, I say, having the different views of the sun to see how it propagates around will be amazing to be able to see that with the magnetic field measurements alongside it. So um, using the phi full disk telescope data, modeling what that field of view is and then our, our Earth field of view, then that should help us understand the global nature of it. But they are beautiful events when they go, and not not all not all big flares have them as well. That's the other thing. So it's that is not understood properly either. 
and, and, and just for those who are not solar physicists, this should be occurring in all stars. Yeah. So it is. So and that, that, that's what one of the things we want to understand. So there, there have been flares where they're for the sun, they are huge flares, but they don't, they don't have these coronal mass ejections or propagations. Um, and that seems to be due to the uh, complexity of the overlying field holding at dawn. So on stars, I kind of imagine in my head that these huge stellar flares are producing these huge mass ejections and it's all a lot more dramatic. But it may be the magnetic field is so strong, it's kind of just holding everything down. So un understanding that would be really interesting. Okay, I see hands already raised. Sergio, Sergio Toledo Redondo, please. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Luis, for this very nice uh, presentation. So I actually have two questions which are a bit uh, specific. But um, so the first one is about these stealth jets that you were presenting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not familiar with them, but uh, I wonder at, at which um, distance from the atmosphere they occur and if you have some sort of uh, estimations of what should be the Alvin velocity in those regions and how does it compare to the jet? Okay, so they, they are occurring in the corona. Um, so I don't think the alpha velocity is going to be much different to normal jets. Um, the, the frequency of them is, is interesting and what causes them is interesting. And we also, so my student Conrad is working on this and that they are very, very subtle in intensity. They're not dramatic, but they seem to be some relationship between um, very small coronal bright points and connections between those. Um, so the thing that the observations we've been doing have been mostly at the poles, so we don't have good magnetic field data, but we'll, we want to try and look uh, closer at the equator where we get that magnetic field data to see what's going on. So if they're or high resolution data sets in the magnetic field that we could connect up with, that could be very interesting. I mean, he has a few examples that are possibly okay magnetic field wise, but we'll need to check. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So my second question, it's, you were showing some data about a very large scale flare in association with a coronal mass ejection multicolor. You were saying that was related to the temperature. Uh, th there was a time scale on the on the bottom of the video, but I couldn't really realize what was the time scale at which this propagation towards the whole sun was occurring. And also that relates yeah. my question to what are the typical time scales of these CMEs or these flares that you can observe with a CME associated? So there's a, there's a range of speeds of CMEs from, you know, 100 kilometers per second to a couple of thousand. Um, the propagation of those waves around the disk maybe takes an hour. It's not very long <laughs> to get around the whole sun, um, so they are they are quite fast. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, Luis, Luis Villot, please. Um, Luis, thank you very much for a fantastic uh, talk. I have a question for you concerning the um, observations by EY that you presented. Yeah. Um, do you think? Or would you say that the campfires are yeah. nano flares? <laughs> um, I don't know yet, I would say. I mean, I think what's interesting, we, what we're currently doing is uh, calibrating, as you know, <laughs> to make sure that any results that we present are, are correct. Um, so some of these are right at the limit of our observation. They're nearly like, you know, one or two pixels. Um, so you can't see them in AIA, for example. But the frequency of them or our, the number of them would maybe be consistent with that. But we haven't done a power law distribution study yet. It's something that's on our list. <laughs> will, will you be able to, to determine their energies? Um, well, currently we, we can obviously measure their intensities and they are quite significantly different from each other. There's, there's quite a broad spectrum. Um, there's also a, a broad spectrum in their, the shape of them. So some of them are long jet-like and some of them are more loop-like. 
Um, so what we're doing now is we're trying to categorize them in, in different, so the small dot-like ones and the loop-like ones and the more ones that show evidence of some kind of flow. Um, but yeah, this is what we're trying to do. Unfortunately, when we were running that, fee was not running. <laughs> so when we're I'm really looking forward to us being in proper science mode where you could go, we can look at fee and it'll help us understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it will come at some point. It will come, yeah. Uh, one last question. Um, do you see those those uh, brightenings also in the quiet sun in the internet work or only in active regions? So the, the movie that I showed was in the quiet sun. Mm -hmm. um, so they're seen in the quiet sun. We haven't, we've only just got observations of an, of an active region. Um, we also have... Uh, Lyman alpha data, which is pseudochromospheric, and uh, we're currently trying to correlate to see if there's any brightenings in the Lyman alpha that are related to those. Um, but that's definitely very much work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that that's kind of getting lowered on in the atmosphere. But the Lyman alpha, you can distinctly see the network mm -hmm. for sure, and you can see brightenings in it which won't surprise you that there's brightenings in the network. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Well, I, I have a, another question myself because I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a layman in, in, in the field. And, and, and then your slide on, on, on how, how flares are, are uh, uh, um, preceded by changes in helicity and then yeah. by tur turbulence and so uh, 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 can i understand that there, there is a a, a course of, of events or a cause effect a, a relationship between the uh, a, a, a growing in, in uh, helicity then turbulence and then the flare or which are the, the physical mechanisms to understand this? Yeah, so I, th I think that's that's true. That order is 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 true. So the helicity is of the first thing to get the energy in. Yeah, right? yeah. increase the helicity so you get the energy in, and then it takes a while for that to propagate into the corona. Um, so the the measurements we see of the turbulence are coronal turbulence. And the the measurements that we saw before the flare, we saw the activation of the flux rope. That's something that the flux rope is this mysterious thing to us, right? You you kind of see it in models, and you can see them at the limb, but on the disc, it's harder to see. Um, so it was nice to be able to see that yes, those are activated before the flare, and that is whatever causes those to erupt is causing the flare. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, this is this is really really be beautiful beautiful because because uh, well uh, uh, indeed I would like to to know how how that electricity is is created uh, and and we yeah. I, I saw I saw so this I stare in the audience and and, and maybe he would ooh, I don't know whether or or Inigo Inigo are already who are over, over there and they can they can tell us because they, they, they as you know they, they they work on stability of those uh, of, of those fields up in the chromosphere and the in, in the corona it is, 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 it is really really beautiful i mean it's, it would be interesting and i mean those kind of measurements of understanding the helicity are to my understanding always of active regions and I wonder what we can do with the smaller scale things that you will see with V, high resolution, when we're looking at really small scale yeah. things. So that, that this is where I, I'm quite desperate to see, for example, the edges of active regions where we see the upflows, right? We're, we're starting to get evidence that those are creating energetic particles. Why are those creating energetic particles? It's just <laughs> not, it's, it's just not clear and without, this very small scale magnetic field data, it will be hard for us to understand that. I have this image in my head of what might be going on, 
Um, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but you know, your edges, your edges are, are different to, uh, to ours. We, we, see, we see edges everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yes. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I'm quite excited to be able to see. This is why I'm curious if we saw the active region the last couple of days. What do you see at the edge, the coronal edges? Yeah. Is there some really small scale behavior we haven't seen before that could be the cause of those energetic particles that we've only observed because Parker's in so close? You yeah. couldn't see them at 1AU, but they're there. Something's causing them. So uh, it, it, it will be really cool if you, in, in the end, you can collaborate and, and make something together. You know, we, we, have, we have already our, our, our student that, uh, who hopefully visit you for, for a while yeah. in, in order to, 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 to have things uh, uh, studied Maybe. together from, from, the, from, from, the, from both. Yeah, I, I think we can start that with the, the work that Conrad's doing. Um, I say he's, he's just reached the point where we have a list where there are a few examples of the, the kind of stealth jets that would possibly be in the right location to look at the magnetic field and even looking at with HMI would be good enough as a start so this this could be something that we can already work on because um, I think those are interesting because they say so you can see them in the upflow in the spectroscopic data but the intensity you would miss it you would not pick it up at all I mean you you kind of if your eye is always distracted oh there's a jet over there <laughs> but that that bit where you're seeing the, the blue shifted is is sometimes just looks so insignificant but it obviously is significant and it's possibly more significant in the magnetic field than we are seeing in the coronal intensity okay okay i think the, there is uh, possibly the last question by by david david orozco so please david oh, hello Luis. hello um, I have a question. Do you plan to, to perform stereoscopy observations between uh, UI and, and SDO? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, because I'm thinking about this uh, fun uh, fire, uh, campfires that you saw with the solar yeah. orbiter. So are you working on that? Yeah, so we've done some work. Um, Yelena here has done some work on also um, 3D spectroscopy in the corona. So not only just the imaging, but also the spectroscopy. So we, we want to be able to get um, an idea of, I mean, the campfires may be too small for this, the 3D imaging, I'm not, I'm not sure, but let, let, let's see how it goes, because so far a lot of it has been done with uh, active regions. But yeah, if we could see one of the campfires spectroscopically with spice, ice, iris, and then SDO, EUI, um, and then fee and HMI, <laughs> it'll make our head hurt, but it would be quite amazing to get those different views. So yeah, definitely we're, we're trying, we're, we're hoping, Yelena's hoping to submit paper in the next month or so for the 3D spectroscopy, but yeah, I'd love to yeah, do that. <laughs> spectroscopy in the, in the corona is already really challenged because it's yeah. optically yeah. thin, so yeah, well. Yeah. I say it will make our heads hurt, but hopefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, may I ask a question, Jose Carlos? Uh, sure. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Luis, for your talk. I am Javier Trujillo Bueno from Tenerife. Hello. And, uh, well, is I am, if I am correct, Solar Orbiter was planned more than 20 or 25 years ago, and finally now is on its way towards the sun. Uh -huh. So all of us are very excited, but in, in your opinion, what should be the next solar space telescope led by Europe? What kind of instrumentation should this future space telescope carry on? So there, there were a number of um, white papers put into ESA, was it last year or the year before? Yeah. Somebody yeah. two years ago now? Um, year. And it, it was a wide array of um, instruments, I mean, some of, some of which are already underway. So the Solar Sea mission in Japan is, it will be looking at spectroscopy with the same spatial and spectral resolution from the chromosphere to the corona. 
which is technically very challenging to do, but that will allow us to track that energy flow through. Um, missions like the NASA One Solaris, there was also a European option for this, and this is to spend more time over the poles. So Sol Orbiter will see the poles for the first time, but it won't do long-term observations. So I think having the longer term observations there are really important, especially for the helioseismology, which will be key to understanding. Um, and then I think as David was saying, the, the multi-few points of the sun with similar instruments. So we had stereo, but stereo didn't have a spectrometer or a magnetograph on. Um, but if you had, I don't know, five or 10, <laughs> I'm just dreaming now, you asked me my dream question. So <laughs> um, with all the same instruments and you've got all these different viewpoints, um, you've got um, missions observing around the equator, but also over the poles with the same instruments, it would be amazing to do that. I think there's lots of ideas on what to do and also how to improve the instruments to measure the magnetic field, photosphere and the chromosphere in the corona. So there's, there's definitely lots still to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. What's your dream instrument? Well, you know very well, it's a spectral polarimetry. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger, better. Yeah. In the, yeah, sorry. In the room, of course. <laughs> so, is there any any more question? Uh, I don't see any any more race times, so I I think we should just clap uh, our hands uh, uh, for for Luis. Thank her for a beautiful for a beautiful uh, uh, talk, and uh, hope that uh, that your personal real visit to Granada, next visit to Granada will be very soon. So I hope so. It will be really much. nice too. But like I say we have we have data that we can start working on together. Yeah. So I will send you it maybe in a few weeks if you're willing. Wonderful. Wonderful. So your student has started, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Is He's he online? Us to digest us. Uh, <laughs> is, he, is he online? Yeah. You can say uh, hello. Uh, he, yeah. Yeah. Say hello, Alejandro. <laughs> no. <laughs> we oh, should we should arrange a telecom. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs>